So we spent a couple of videos looking at the notion of continuity among functions of real numbers. I wanna recall that really quick and then we'll look at some topological implications of continuity. So let's recall that f from a to r where a is a subset of the real numbers is continuous at a point little a in a if for every epsilon bigger than zero, there is a delta bigger than zero such that if x is in a and the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon. So the epsilon is like a challenge. Can you live up to that challenge and get the function within epsilon of this certain value f of a? And then this is equivalent to something called sequential continuity. We proved this in a previous video that says for all sequences of numbers x sub n in a such that the limit as n goes to infinity of x sub n equals a we have the limit as n goes to infinity of f of x sub n equals f of a so sometimes this is useful in fact this is often useful for proving algebraic properties of limits and continuity because we know all the algebraic properties of limits of sequences and stuff like that already Okay, so here we want to look at some topological implications of continuity, and this is in the forward direction of the function. So if we know something about a set in the domain, what can we say about its image? And so the first question we want to look at is, is if B is open, is F of B open? So the answer to this will be no and we'll furnish a counterexample. You don't have to look very hard for a counterexample. Let's go ahead and take um, b to be the open interval minus four pi up to four pi. And then we'll take f of x to be the function sine of x. And notice that the image of b will be the closed interval negative one to one. So here we have an open set, but over here we have a non-open set. Notice it's a closed set, but sets are allowed to be closed and open. It just happens that that one is not closed and open. That one is only closed. Now the next one is, if B is closed, is F of B closed? So the answer to this is also going to be no. And we can also furnish a pretty simple example. So let's take B to be all real numbers. So the set of all real numbers is open and closed. And then we'll take f of x to be the arctan of x. And then we want to recall that the inverse tangent has this nice asymptotic property in the forward infinity direction and the backwards infinity direction that tell us that f of b here is minus pi halves to pi halves, and that is an open interval. So over here we have a closed set, R is a closed set. Over here we have a set which is not closed. It's an open interval, open intervals are never closed. And then next, if B is a bounded set, is F of B a bounded set? Well, the answer to this is also going to be no. We can furnish an example. And so let's go ahead and consider the interval zero to one. So let's say that is our set B. So notice that's most definitely a bounded set. And then we'll consider f of x to be the function one over x. So notice that's gonna be continuous everywhere on this open interval. It's obviously not continu continuous at zero, but we're not including zero there. Now the next thing we wanna notice is that the image of f of B here is going to be one to infinity. So it is unbounded above. And so here we found something where the set was bounded, but the image was unbounded. And then the last question is, if B is compact, is F of B compact? So let's recall in the real numbers, and in fact, in Rn, compact is the same thing as being closed and bounded. So you're getting this property right here and this property right here. Well, it turns out that yes, 
this is true. If you have a compact set, then the image of that compact set is also compact. And that's what we'll prove for the rest of the video. Now we're ready to prove that result that we hinted at on the last board. And that can be described with the following theorem. So let's suppose that F from A to R is continuous at every little a in A. So it's continuous on the whole set A, and A is a subset of the real numbers. Then we want to suppose that if k is a compact subset of A, then f of k is compact. So that's what we want to show, that f of A is compact if k is compact. So I want to recall that compactness is equivalent to sequential compactness in the real numbers, and that is given by this definition. So I've translated the definition of sequential compactness to f of k. So we can show that f of k is compact if and only if every sequence inside of f of k has a convergent subsequence y sub n sub k that converges to y and that y is also in f of k. So we'll show that f of k is compact by showing that that holds. So let's go ahead and get on with the proof. So we're going to suppose that we have some arbitrary sequence inside of the image of k. So in other words, we've got this arbitrary sequence, we'll call it y sub n, n goes from one to infinity, it is a subset of f of k. But the fact that it is in the image of k under the map f, that means there exists x sub n, let's say n goes from one to infinity, which is a subset of k such that f of x sub n equals y sub n. But now we're gonna use the fact that k is compact to get a subsequence of this x sub n. So since k is compact, we have a convergent subsequence x sub n sub k, which is like I said, a subsequence of x sub n, such that the limit as k goes to infinity of x sub n sub k equals x, which is inside of k. So we've just applied the definition of compactness to k in the sequential compactness version. Okay, great. And now, since f is continuous, we can in fact really just evaluate both sides of this equality at the function. So let's go ahead and do that. So since f is continuous, and here we're using the sequential version of con continuity like this over here, we have the limit as k goes to infinity of f of x sub n sub k equals f of x. Good. But that f of x, well, that's going to be equal to some number y in f of k. And that's because this x is in k. And then furthermore, we know that this limit down here can be rewritten as the limit as k goes to infinity of y sub n sub k. In other words, it is a subsequence of our original sequence. So let's see what we've done. We took an arbitrary sequence and we constructed a subsequence of this arbitrary sequence in f of k that converges to something in f of k. But that's exactly what we needed to show that f of k was compact. Great. And so that finishes the proof of this theorem. Now I'm going to go ahead and clean this up and we're going to look at a result from Calculus 1 that follows very quickly from this theorem. We're going to finish this video off with something called the Extreme Value Theorem. So you hopefully remember this from Calculus 1. It says that if you have a closed bounded interval and a continuous function on that closed bounded interval, then that function attains its maximum and its minimum somewhere on that interval. So we're going to spice this up a little bit by exchanging the interval for just a compact set. So let's go ahead and look at the careful statement here. So if f goes from k to r is continuous at every a in k, so on the whole set k, where k is a subset of the real numbers and it's compact, 
then there exists x naught and x1 in k such that f of x naught is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to f of x1 for all x in k. So here, this f of x naught means is the minimum, and then this f of x1 is the maximum. So not only does this function have a minimum or a lower bound and a maximum or an upper bound, but it attains the minimum and the maximum on that set. And that's what we get from this x naught x1 being in k. So before we look at the short proof of this, I want to recall this fact that we proved in a previous video. And that is every compact set contains its supremum and its infimum. So in other words, its least upper bound and its greatest lower bound. So we're gonna use this fact just right out of the gate. So let's go ahead and look at the proof. So our last theorem gives us the fact that f of k is compact. So recall that that said that the image of a compact set under a continuous function is compact. But now we're going to use this thing that we just recalled to know that the infimum of this set and the supremum of this set are actually contained in this set. So in other words, we know that little m, which is equal to the nth of f of k, is an element of f of k, the image of k under f. And similarly, capital M, which is the supremum of f of k, is inside of f of k for like a companion reason. Great. But the fact that little m is inside of f of k tells us that little m is equal to f of x naught for x naught in k. That's what it means to be in the image of k under the map f. And then similarly, the fact that capital M is in f of k means that capital M equals f of x1 for some x1 in k. Again, that's what it means to be in the image. Great. But now we know that every element from this set, f of k, must lie between little m and big M. So in other words, f of x is always between little m and big M. That's by the definition of the supremum and the infimum of a set. Because notice everything in f of k can be written in this form, f of x where x is in k. But we just showed that this m was equal to f of x naught for some x naught. And this capital M was f of x1 for some x1. And like I said, this holds for all x in k. So that finishes this proof of the extreme value theorem, and that's a good place to stop.